So it's now 10.01. <clears throat> I'm going to call the um, CEO board briefing to order. <clears throat> For the Board of County Commissioners, let the record reflect that we have all three commissioners present. And uh, we're going to um, uh, uh, make a couple changes in the order of our agenda this morning to accommodate one of our guests. Uh, so we're going to move item two up to item one and one down to two. So uh, this is the uh, follow-up on the request for Greenstone Corporation to create a tax income and finance district at the Kaiser site. And I know that based on our last conversation, uh, Mr. Kogan, you were going to provide some uh, economic uh, 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 work for uh, uh, the commissioners to review. And so uh, then we were going to reconvene and uh, discuss about moving forward and stuff. So. Roy, you want to give us a brief update of where you're at? Um, sure. Um, Mr. Frank uh, did provide that information and we did send it to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, Jim is is on uh, the call right now. So he so to subject himself to questions from the board. I know some board members have questions with respect to the nature of the improvements uh, and the nature of the private development. Uh, I do understand that the public improvements are required due, to, and Jim, uh, Frank, if you can confirm this, due to the uh, retail commercial um, in, uh, development. Uh, so that, that is the main impetus. Uh, Jim, can I turn it over to you? And so, uh, Jim, you're on mute. You're on mute, Jim. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, uh, I, uh, I, I appreciate you um, moving me forward. I've got to testify at the legislative hearing on a condominium reform bill. So uh, hopefully we can make some progress in that area. Um, but um, <clears throat> the, if, I, if I can share my screen, maybe it will help provide some background. I've, I can review the numbers a little bit and I can show you the site plan about how this site might develop a bit. Right. It, can you do that? Yep, should be able to now. You should be able to now, Jim. Okay. Can you, are you able to see that, uh, that site plan? Yes, we can. So the, the site's about, includes about 400 acres here, um, and it runs along the Newport Highway, and then along the new North Spokane Corridor. And um, this is the Costco property here. And then this is the um, this is the uh, property that is being retained by Kaiser, and this is about 100 acres of the site, and this portion of the site will be developed um, as a commercial retail uh, office uses, and then the portion of the site that's in yellow. Um, is about 300 acres and this will be developed as primarily residential but there is a core of retail um, that will be in the center of the property here along along Pittsburgh. It's intended to be a mixed use development in, uh, in its essence but it has a very significant uh, retail component to it along the Newport Highway that has access from both the interchange here off the North Spokane corridor at Farwell. And then there's another interchange at Park Smith, which is just south of the site. <clears throat> then I did a, um, the financial projections. So these are the uh, financial projections that I had sent over. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if you're going to be able to read all of this, but 
these projections run from uh, 2021 to about uh, 2043. So <clears throat> this is uh, approximately a 20 to 25 year period. And what we've done is we've estimated the build out of the residential portion of the project. Then we've estimated the build out of the commercial and retail portion of the project. So those are in the first two columns. And then <clears throat> the third column is the annual increase in property tax valuation that will occur. So we've been involved in a couple of TIF projects. And so I, I think we have a, a pretty good handle on the timing of these things and how long it takes to um, for everything to eventually build out. So um, the commercial portion includes 1.2 million square feet of, of retail. So we've assumed that this is going to build out at about 50,000 square feet a year. Now, this is probably a, a conservative number. It may go quite a bit faster than that. But when we're doing these financial projections, we're trying to be somewhat conservative in, in, in how this builds up. So the, the fourth column that you see here is the, um, is the CES value increment that's being created over time. So at the end of the district, we created, our projections are that we created slightly more than $750 million of assessed value increase um, in the district. And that gradually builds up from, uh, from the base uh, uh, over the 20, 20 to 25 year period to about $750 million. And then <clears throat> the um, the final two columns are just the tax increment that's being created and then the cumulative tax increment. So it, it basically allows us to look at where might the payoff be in terms of the public improvement. So the, the infrastructure development is uh, detailed on a second tab here. And this details the specific projects that would be funded with the TIF money. And all of these projects are the basic infrastructure. It totals about $16 million. And this is the basic infrastructure that's necessary to support the commercial development of the site. And it involves building a, a new um, arterial, primary arterial that would run from Crestline uh, down to Hawthorne. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you where those infrastructure improvements are. I'll go back to the site plan in a second. Um, but this, what this shows is it takes about 20 years to get repayment of the, of the $16 million in, um, in, uh, in, uh, infrastructure development costs. And then in the final columns here, I've estimated based on this growth that I projected of the retail and commercial space, I projected uh, the county share of sales tax. Um, and the county share of sales tax uh, gets up to slightly more than $2 million a year um, in, the, um, in year 2035. So in about 15 years, the county share of the sales tax increases you know, gradually increases as commercial development comes online and retail development comes online, and then eventually um, uh, reaches this total of $2 million. Um, now that number will continue to grow because at this point, the retail is not fully built out. So I just didn't carry it beyond here, beyond the $2 million point, but it'll continue to grow all the way down until the full build out of the retail, which is shown there in in column two, so um, so the project does generate um, a significant amount of uh, retail sales tax and 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 about seven hundred fifty million dollars of uh, property tax additional increment. Um, <clears throat> Let 
<clears throat> so this is the um, so this is the uh, site plan again. So we're building an arterial here that runs from Crestline and Farwell. It runs through the site all the way down to here. Once it gets down here, it continues south along um, the alignment of Helena all the way down to Hawthorne. So there's about another um, half a mile off the site of arterial development that, that extends down south to Hawthorne. So Hawthorne, of course, is the street that fronts the former uh, Mead Works um, site. And, and at Hawthorne, you get access to both uh, uh, Highway 2 and to the North Spokane Corridor at this Park Smith exit. So <clears throat> this arterial is really necessary to divert traffic off of US Highway, the State Highway 2. Uh, the, the project really generates too much traffic and causes uh, significant traffic issues on Highway 2 if you don't build an, art, an arterial, a secondary arterial that would parallel Highway 2 between Farwell and Hawthorne. Um, and this is very similar to um, but I'll say Indiana near the, uh, in the Spokane Valley between Flora and uh, Sullivan. Uh, you have Indiana that parallels um, the freeway. And at Liberty Lake, you have Country Vista that parallels the freeway from State Line to Barker. And, and that parallel arterial allows the traffic to disperse and a lot of different points so that you're not trying to focus all the traffic out onto Highway 2 at either um, Pittsburgh, which is here adjacent to Costco, or a south entrance down here. So it's trying to get, um, trying to deal with uh, heavy infrastructure requirements, the arterial development requirements that would open up this land for development. And that's really what's prevented this land from developing is the the inadequacy of the transportation system. And there is some major um, water transmission facilities for both Spokane County Water District number three and for Whitworth Water District. Um, there's major uh, water infrastructure that has to go in here as well. And that's, that's included in uh, the $16 million. Uh, um, and we're working with, uh, the Spokane County Water District to put a main, a big distribution main in here that would come down this line and give them access to serve. It'll increase their capacity to serve this whole area here that's west of Highway 2. Um, <clears throat> the, um, so I think that's the gist of it. The, the, the road system uh, that you have to develop for a residential, you know, community. Uh, that's none of those. None of those roads are being paid for as part of the TIF. The the TIF money is only being used for the major arterial structural system to um, handle the traffic flow. Uh, the traffic flow from the commercial projects are, you know, seventy percent of the traffic flow. The peak hour traffic flow from the project is really generated by. Uh, the commercial development. And none of the TIF money is being used to develop the, the streets and infrastructure in the residential uh, part of the project. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. <clears throat> Can you get me back to the big screen, Ron? So uh, 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 Mary or Josh, do you have any questions for, uh, for Jim? Um, All right. What? I think, Jim, this is the first time, you know, seeing the map and seeing what your proposal is. Cause I mean, I saw the, the, the dollar amounts, but that didn't really, you know, tell me what, what was happening with it or any of that. Right. And with that arterial, I mean, that makes sense. Have you talked to the DOT? Is that, you know, is that part of what the future SEPA information comes in at? Yeah, I mean, we're working with both the County Engineering Department and WashDOT 
on a traffic and on a new traffic study that traffic study is underway right now and that traffic study will be um, the basis for understanding the, all of the details of this transportation system that we've outlined here there are access points to farwell which is a dot facility um, and then there's access two access points to um, sr2 both of which involve wash dot and and so that the money's not just that arterial it it also involves the access control that's required to the state facilities so there's left turn lanes there may be another traffic circle or access control uh, on us highway 2 um, there's on, down on hawthorne there's likely a, a traffic light on hawthorne um, so there's there's a lot of uh, details that um, haven't been totally worked out because they're based on uh, the final results of the traffic study, but <clears throat> we believe we're very we, we believe we have a good understanding of what the uh, traffic control requirements are going to be uh, for the full development of the site. So yes, we're closely working with Washington. Okay, and then. Um, just seeing kind of that site plan, just basically. Um, so, so I guess trying to figure out where the retail, you know, over by Costco, is that, you know, is it the future Kaiser property that's the future retail? Yes, yes. The, mo the, the vast majority of the retail, which is about 1.2 million square feet, is along that, that corridor strip that, that uh, runs along US 2. And so it's the land between the new arterial that we develop and SR2. That land between the arterial and SR2 is the area that would be primarily uh, commercial and retail. And our estimate is that about 60% of that will be retail, would be shopping center type retail development. And then the rest of it, the other 40% um, would be office uses, um, some, some technology uses and uh, hospitality, hotel uses, um, medical office uses and so forth. Um, but the, the majority of it, we estimate 60%. And that's what the, the, the projections that I did on, on retail sales tax is based on that 60% uh, of the site being developed as shopping center retail. Yeah, yeah, in light of COVID and all of that, I mean, we're just seeing a huge shift right now and no one really knows what that new normal is going to be as we come out of this with retail and um, office space, quite frankly, both of those. So, yeah. um, so, so those are just some of my concerns, you know, we're, we're, to me, this is very preliminary that, you know, I mean, I think it's worth investigating, but I, you know, there's, there's a lot of unknowns still here for me um, to know what what my thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, I think the key, the key issue, I think there's a couple of points. Um, the first one is that um, this is very similar to the situation that existed in Liberty Lake on the north side of the freeway prior to the TIF district that was there. That was a large piece of land, 500 acres. It had no infrastructure of any kind. And so it's very difficult to get investment in that property because of the massive amount of infrastructure that was necessary. So the TIF district really helped there. And of course you can see what's happening on the north side of the freeway now. A lot of land has been opened up for development that, that but for the, the investment in infrastructure would not have happened. The second thing is, and, and I think this is really important, and, and I think it's the only way really for TIFs to work, is that that investment, in, investment in that, in that infrastructure has to come from the private sector. So we're not asking the, the county to take any financial risk here. So if for some reason this doesn't work, the risk is on, is on Greenstone. Greenstone is spending the money. And if for some reason, um, it doesn't develop as we had thought it was, then that risk will fully fall on us. Um, and we've operated the, the TIF 
at River District that way, we've operated the TIF at Kendall Yards that, that very same way. Um, so uh, that's, that's all that I'd offer there is that this, if you don't have public investment in big chunks of land where you have a big chunk of land like this, it will sit idle for a long time. And, and that's really what's happened here, despite the fact that, that there's a lot of growth happening in Spokane, you don't see anything, virtually anything happening here other than the Costco site because of just the massive amount of, of infrastructure that has to occur. Um, and, and so we're willing to make that investment and we're confident, uh, honestly, that, um, that this will work. They're, they're working, Kaiser's working right now with a large shopping center developer on about 30 acres that's south of the Costco site. That's, um, and we've made a commitment to try to get this road infrastructure completed uh, most of it completed by the end of 22 and the balance of it completed by the end of 25. So it's a, it's a massive amount of work to do in a very short period of time, um, but we're prepared to do that. Okay, Josh? Jim, yes. This, does the TIF, does the proposed TIF boundary include the Costco property? Uh, yes, but Costco's in the base. Costco's in the base. So that the increment does not include uh, Costco. Costco's in the base uh, property tax assessment. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave. I really do apologize, but I've got, to, I've got that hearing to go to um, the, um, the legislative hearing. No, that we understand, uh, uh, Jim. Thanks for spending some time with us. Uh, you know, from my standpoint, uh, thank you for uh, looking at this property and, uh, and the commitment. You've got a track record of success, and it would certainly be uh, great to bring that uh, track record to the county and the north side. So uh, thank you, and uh, good luck with the legislature. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So uh, any more uh, conversation on uh, uh, basically what Jim is looking for is uh, are we willing to uh, move forward and, and work with him on developing the TIF or not? Uh, I just wanna point out that uh, when we sold the old Corral property, one of the conditions we had on it was that uh, the developer develop uh, some retail and commercial along with the residential. And now we've got a developer that is doing exactly what we wanted to, and they're willing to do it on their nickel and not ours. So uh, just uh, from the sake of consistency, it seems like uh, working with Jim on this uh, uh, would be consistent with the policy we've already adopted with regard to the old corral property, but, uh, you know, that's uh, up for discussion. Josh, is he? Yeah, no, I, so the, the question I have, and I, I was going to ask, I unmuted, and then he said he had to leave. Did, did anybody find out what the breakdown was of the res, of the 1,440, uh, residential units, how many of that was single family versus multifamily? Uh, I had that, Roy, do you have that? Um, I, I do not have that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so uh, going from memory, it was 400, 400 was multifamily and 1,000 uh, single family home uh, residences. Okay, what, what was that in something we got emailed or something? I, I, I haven't seen that anywhere, so I, uh, well, I've got it in my notes, so, but uh, uh, we can confirm that with uh, Jim. Okay. Yeah, I, I will get that information from uh, Mr. Frank. And one of the things I do want to make sure is clear is the Costco property is included in the TIF, but the base value would be its current base value. So the county would continue to get all of the Costco assessed value. Uh, and there's and no portion um, of the sales tax collected in this area will go to the TIF. It's only ad valorem property taxes. Yeah, so the property tax increase that we were going to see with Costco, we've seen what we have ahead of us is the incremental increase, which would be included in this TIF, but no sales tax. I did have a conversation last week with uh, uh, the other commercial developer, which I know that 
uh, you two also know, and uh, he's poised to move forward if we can move forward with Jim on uh, on the infrastructure. Remember when we were looking at this from Kaiser, you know, they were looking at 27 million for the TIF, but uh, that included all the interior roads and uh, Jim has taken all those interior roads out of it and is just uh, uh, looking at the major uh, arterial as the uh, infrastructure, which is similar to what WashDOT has been pushing for 195 corridor down in Spokane, uh, Spokane Valley or Lake Valley, and also what we're working with them to do up in the West Plains. So the approach with regard to traffic is the same here as it is in the other two locations. And quite frankly, with what they've already done at Liberty Lake. Mary? Um, so, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the old Corral property, that was a sale that we did. And in part of the sale, we, we are retail. We're not doing the infrastructure for them. And we're not doing a TIF with the old Corral versus here. Um, no, we don't have, we don't have yeah, I, I think here, I mean, I'm, you know, this is the first I'm seeing of what the infrastructure is. I mean, we, I, I don't know, Josh, if you've seen the maps or any of that, I haven't. Um, so, I mean, I'm very interested to continue the conversation. I'm not, I'm not going to commit that I'm okay with a TIF today, but I'm, you know, I'm interested to have, continue the conversation to, to understand it more. Um, so that way, you know, I can formulate, you know, my, my thoughts on it, you know, it's like, I, I thought he was wanting everything kind of like what we saw before. If he's not, you know, that some of that changes uh, my thoughts. So this is the first time seeing it. Okay. Josh. No, I, I, I like the, the, the concept. Um, but le like Mary, that that's the first time I'd seen that map. I, I hadn't seen that. I did see the spreadsheet. And, and sort of the, the, the cover letter that, letter that came with it. But uh, no, at, at, at first glance, I, I like the concept. I think uh, that's something that, that, that would be utilized. I think, you know, if uh, w when that is built out, the, those, those are homes that'll sell very fast in that area. And quite frankly, I think, um, you know, as it continues to grow, that's an area that can support that additional retail. I mean, yes, there is still always that unknown, like Mary mentioned about, you know, is is retail changing you know but i mean that's that's one of those things we we don't know we we, we don't know at this time but but no i you know it's i, I think we I, I would like some additional additional information but no at, at, at first glance i i like the concept i was going to ask the same question i think you were josh before jim had to go because of the sensitivity to the school district out there i think mm -hmm. that, yeah as soon as you asked that i thought how many how many single family versus multi yeah that's yeah. You're, that's something they're going to be asking you about so but i'm sure jim can provide that information yeah i'll, I'll get that information for the for um, the county today thank you okay. well and the nature of retail is going to change but i think the one thing that's still going to require brick and mortar is uh service sector retail uh, you know, product that you can buy off of Amazon or off the internet. I think that's clearly going to have an impact on brick and mortar. And, you know, one of those uh, properties that I think is going to suffer dramatically, quite frankly, is Northtown Mall. You got Sears that's already closed. You got uh, Penny's that's on the in bankruptcy and you got Macy's already saying that they're going to close. So the only thing that's going to be left up there is uh, going to be the theaters and uh, uh, the other retailer in the Northeast corner and that's gonna be it. So, uh, you know, Northtown or properties like that are gonna have a pretty significant change in their future, uh, much like I think uh, office is going to change. Uh, but I don't think office is gonna have as much change as retail will, but we'll see. I mean, all of it is a, is a black crystal ball right now. But if there's any, I mean, uh, having, having Jim drive a TIF up there gives me a much higher level of confidence than having Kaiser drive it. Uh, Jim's already got two successful TIF projects that uh, have, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to have Kendall Yards in North Spokane. I mean, that's one of the things we talked about with the old corral and now you got a developer that's willing to, uh, to uh, put his money at risk to be able to make that happen. So, uh, so is the message that we tell Jim is 
we're interested in pursuing it, but we've got more information that we need uh, until we can get to a final decision. Is that a fair summary? So it is for me. Yep. It is, it is for me because I, I think we need to see the map and, you know, all of kind of what the plan is. Okay. So, Roy, can you take that back to Jim and, and then get us the information that, uh, that we were talking about? Uh, sure. And, and, and some of that we're going to have to have um, as part of the proceedings to form the, the, the tax recommend district and to give the, give the appropriate public notice. So I will get back to Jim today. Um, you know, the way we've worked uh, with developers, with all developers, is the county is our client, not Jim. Right. Um, but since some of these projects start, they never go anywhere. Uh, the developer, you know, pays all of our fees to form the tax recommend district. Mm -hmm. So the county is not at risk, uh, even for the work that we do. So, uh, you know, what I could start to do is one, I will email Jim right after this call. And two, um, we'll start taking a look at the proceedings we need to draft to form the TIFs to make sure we have all the requisite information from, from Jim Frank, uh, which will require boundaries and, more, uh, and a lot of detail. Okay. And we'll get that off to the board. Uh, I'll get the breakdown residential single family today, and then we'll get the rest of rest of it off to the board um, either later this week or the first thing next week. Okay. All right. Sounds like a plan. Anything else that we need to share with uh, Roy or pass along to Jim? Uh, no. Thank you for your time. Right. Very good. So that gets us back to. You. Mr. Mark McLean, and we're going to talk about vacations. And not the right kind of vacation. <laughs> but, uh, I was contacted through the building and planning department by an attorney named Dara Brewey, who uh, apparently Saltis had a plot, and on two of the lots, a um, stormwater collection area was on two of the lots. They, have, they want to basically shove it over onto one of the lots. There's an alternative process through the code, through the state code that permits that. Um, it, and had it been any more complicated than I think it was, then we would have asked for a full plot amendment. Uh, but we took this through uh, Matt, uh, I forget his last name, starts with Z, over at Hatch. He did the stormwater uh, for public sure. court. Yeah, that's right. And he took a look at the size. He has no issue with the si resizing of the stormwater uh, collection area. There's nothing that will impact the pond for it, or excuse me, the pipe. So we think this is fine to do. We also note that in the agreement, any further amendment of the plot will require a uh, full plot amendment. So we think this will also get picked up in any sort of um, title search. We don't have any concerns there. Okay. Any questions for Mark? Mary? No, I, I think Bud Morrison had reached out to me as well on this property. So I, I think if, as long as you guys are okay with it, I think we're, I'm, I'm okay with it. Okay, very good. All right. Thank you all. Um, so that gets us to miscellaneous. Um, any miscellaneous for either one of you? Seeing nothing. And uh, Jerry? Jerry does. Uh, far do. back. Oh, yeah. I've got a few things. One of the requests that we've had from the Spokane Public Schools is that they would like to see if they could come in to present to the board uh, some of the rationale behind their levy request. And if that's okay with the board, I'll have Gina get on the schedule and see if we can uh, get them in. So Jerry, on that one, I was contacted by a representative of the school district this morning, wondering if we would be willing to consider a, a, a commissioner endorsement of the ballot measure. And I told them that um, to be able to do any kind of endorsement requires a full notice and public hearing process. And that typically has not been what we've engaged in uh, individual commissioners can endorse, but for the board to endorse a ballot measure really is a, 
a pretty protracted process. So are, with them coming in, are they coming in with the expectation that they're going to ask for an endorsement? Or are they just coming in to share information? The only the information I had is they just wanted to come in and do a presentation on their factual levy issues. I They did not, I'm not aware they wanted a, any kind of an endorsement. But I can clarify that before we, especially after you've had a conversation with one of their representatives. But I don't think they're asking for, an, if they were asking for an endorsement, they didn't, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Just, a, just a presentation. We might want to confirm that just so that we don't get ourselves sideways. We will. I'll have Gina help me and we'll confirm that, that there's no ask for an endorsement. Okay, Mary. So who, Al, who, who reached out to you from, this, from the school district? Uh, school, uh, uh, Spokane Public Schools. Right. I, can you, I can tell you off the record. Oh, okay. Um, just because I know. It was, it was somebody in the leadership. Okay. I just know I had, you know, the, the finance person reach out to me just asking, saying in the past that they had come and talked to the commissioners about their levy. I haven't been on the board since they've been a levy, so because it was three years ago. Um, so I, I just told her she needed to reach out to Jerry, you know, and this was like a month ago. So I know GSI has requested if people want to sign on to support the levies, um, you know, that we can, we, that can be done of which, you know, I did. Um, but I'm, I'm with you where I'm not interested as a board. I don't think it's good for us as a board to endorse something like this, you know, happy to get informed and to know, you know, what, what their thoughts are as to why they're doing the levy. Um, and then us individually do what we want to do. So yeah, I can't. Come. Yeah, I can't remember the last time the board has actually endorsed a, a ballot measure, um, but um, uh, it, it is a very public process. You got to have hearing, got to have both uh, sides be able to present, yada, yada, yada. And it's uh, just something we've tried to avoid in the past. So, but yeah, I just got the call like eight o'clock this morning. So I can share with you offline who it was. Okay. Okay, thank you. I also, Gina, is Gina there? Yeah. Yes, I get this get this wrong. Uh, there is a, let me get my phone here. The Olympia fly-in dates somewhere in between the February 3rd and 18th. And if I understand the question here, we need to confirm a quorum during that period of time. Gina, did I say that right? Yeah, so what it is, is they're going to be doing a six-part series between the dates of the 3rd and the 18th. Right, and right. So I just wanted to confirm if you guys are all going to be doing that the same week or, you know, if we need to cancel a week in one of those. No, no. Well, I, I think the, the issue with it is, so it it's going to be six sessions sometime within those days. I don't think they've narrowed down exactly what days and what times yet. So I I assume it's something that we would, I assume the three of us will at least make an attempt to, to make it if it fits our schedules. So I assume it'd be something that we would want to at least notice because I mean, I, I assume there will, there's a high likelihood at least two of us will be at each session if it fits our schedules because they're, they're just, I think that they'll be by Zoom. Probably they'll have to coordinate with the legislators' schedules on when they have time to get on Zoom. And then, I mean, I, I don't even know how much advance notice we would get to the scheduling of the uh, of of each of those sessions. So, so I just got a text that said that those dates and uh, times have uh, have now been posted on the website. Have they? So okay. They, they are available to us. Um, uh, Karen is telling me that she emailed me the information this morning. I've not seen it, but I assume that I've got it. And so the question, I mean, one question in my mind is, are these going to be sessions that we're going to participate in by Zoom? Or are they going to be sessions they expect us to be in Olympia for? I no, thought, I thought everything was being done remotely. It's, it, it's virtual. I, I, I got, so I, I got an email last night that just from from GSI that was just 
um, letting us know that we have four free passes or, or you know paid entrances into these series and so essentially we need to let gsi know who our four people are that that want to participate okay so maybe what we do is we take a look at the schedule and uh, the topics and and uh they probably look a lot like what ron has up on the screen oh So you have the times, but you don't have the topics? No, uh, Four Corners looks like it'll be on February 18th, 1 to 2 p.m. Okay. Oh, so most of those are Wednesday and Thursday, so it won't affect the Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. So, so, so I, 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 I can email you the, or I mean, I, I can just read to you the, the, the short email that I got last night from GSI. And it just says that, thank you for your continued investment in GSI. Our next big event included in, in your membership benefits is the Olympia fly-in. Sit back and relax because we are bringing Olympia to you in this six part series between February 3rd and 18th, we will hear from six different legislative districts and six different agency officials. Your organization will receive four all access passes. We will finalize all detail, or while we finalize all details, please send me the names and email addresses of the four individuals who will utilize these passes. We look forward to you joining us for uh, an incredibly important conversation. That says, please RSVP um, uh, pr prior to um, Friday, January 29th. So, so yeah, that, that's that's the schedule, but we need, that they need four names. I assume the three of us, and then we have one extra. Well, I would, I would assume the one extra would either be Jerry or Jared, but, uh, I guess it's up to the group, but who we want the fourth to be. Should Mike be there too? Well, Mike will have his own own access. Okay. Mike Burgess. Those dates, those dates are all on a Wednesday and a Thursday, so we don't have a conflict apparently with the with the quorum for the board meetings. For the I just looked at my calendar, and I'm I think I'm good for those dates and times, so I'll definitely um, get it. Have Jim get it on my calendar. For the fourth one, maybe it could be like an office, Jared or Jerry. And show it in here oh to manage the zoom oh just if people, if people wanted to come in and watch it oh i see what you're saying yeah we could do that too then. yeah okay so did, did you guys hear what ron was suggesting that the uh, fourth be in the office here and that way people can walk in or out or participate and that way we're not limited to just one yeah that's a good idea okay that's a really good idea. So there's our four. So maybe uh, Jared's account so we can just plug it in here. Yeah. Okay. So next item, Mr. Gimmel. I had a phone call from a Ms. Laura Price who works for the clerk's office at the city of Spokane, reaching out regarding the West Quadrant TIF status. And I think I know what the status is, but I was just going to bring that up before I call her back. So what's the status on the utility tax? Still pending. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Yeah, I, like I say, I, I just want to give you guys a heads up. I think I know what the answer is. I'll give her a call uh, when this meeting's over. Okay. And Mary, do you want me to bring up the co this kind of a summary of a conversation we're having this morning? Um, yeah, I can. Um, so I have been informed that House Bill 1155 is the Shrek bill from Richelli and Ormsby on getting the one tenth money. So uh, we were talking about that this morning, how to, you know, what we were going to do. Um, so there's a letter that's being drafted that will be signed by, um, you know, as, as many of the uh, uh, law enforcement and fire chiefs and seeing if other people may want to sign on. Um, when we talked to Burgess, he was, he was, you know, should we sign on or not? Um, 
you know, so I think just because they're going to get the hearing next week, then um, I guess I would just ask that if we're willing, depending on if there's how many signatures, um, you know, whether we want to sign on or not, um, you know, may not, you know, it, it may be more effective being all the law enforcement, but in order for Burgess to really make that determination, I think from us right now, it's just, are, are we okay if we want to sign on to the letter? And if that doesn't happen, are we okay with that? Um, I just want to make sure that if, you know, we potentially can sign on to it uh, at something other than an open public meeting, if it's necessary. Josh? It, would it make more sense to send a letter specifically signed by just law enforcement and then we do our own letter stating our position on it as a board? That, that way we're not meshing the two together, if that's the concern. Um, I mean, are, I mean is, is, is that what you were getting at was they don't know if they want law enforcement and elected officials on one letter? Yeah, I think Burgess was wanting to get who are the users of the system, you okay. know, why this is a good idea to be the forefront of it. And then gotcha. we added more elected officials to it, then would that dilute that? Um, so that, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't committed at this point in time, you know, we, we just all talking about this this morning. So I think it's, you know, I just want to have the option if he wants, if he thinks it's better for us to sign on or if we do a separate letter. Um, I mean, I know we're all, none of us are, in, well, I, I'm not in support of it. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to do whatever Burgess thinks is best um, to counter uh, this bill. So whether it could be a separate letter from us or it could be a, a, you know, signing on to the other letter. But Burgess wasn't, he wasn't, she was, he wasn't sure this morning. Jerry, is that the kind of the impression you got? Okay. Yeah, we've got, there was a letter that was submitted by a group of folks uh, last time this came up that we're trying to get our, get a copy of so we can see what the template looks like. Um, I think it, I think it would be good that depending on what Mike thinks is the best approach to to be able to move in whatever direction that is, especially if it gets a hearing uh, next week. So there's not a lot of time. So maybe the board could could uh, authorize using your signatures if needed in something other than a open public meeting. I know that when uh, Jerry and I and Mike uh, met with uh, Richelli last week, uh, this topic came up. And, um, you know, we did, uh, I did a pretty good job of, of uh, trying to educate Richelli about, you know, the system operates cheaper, operates faster. We got a better response for our citizens for all the reasons why you would want to do this. We're hitting the, hit the ball out of the park and stuff. And so he did ask for uh, some backup to support our statement. And so Jerry uh, aligned uh, uh, Richelli with, uh, what's the lady's name? Lori Markham. Lori Markham, to get him all of the data necessary to support uh, the claims we made and stuff. But, you know, this, this is, once again, all about politics and not about service or program efficiency or saving taxpayer dollars. It's all about, you know, the, them and us. And, and I do not know that he reached out to Lori. I don't think he did. I don't think he did either. I think he dropped, I think they dropped the bill real soon after we had our meeting. Yeah. It, it was, it was dropped yesterday, I believe, yeah. with the, from, from what Ron had up there. Um, that's the, when you see the, the intro date, I think that that bill was dropped yesterday, which means that had to have been drafted prior to yesterday. So yeah, J January 12th. So that, so that, that would have been on yesterday's intro sheet. And I, I'm hearing that it's just Richelli and Ormsby that have signed on, you know, that are the... Are yeah, if, Ron, if you scroll up. Yep, right there. Richelli and Ormsby. So today, so when, when a bill hits an intro sheet, the members have until, I believe it's two o'clock the next day, if they want to sign on as a co-sponsor. So at two o'clock today, if there's no additional names, then those are the sponsors of the bill. Um, for the remainder of session. So we'll, we'll, we'll know more in a couple hours if, 
if they pick up any any uh, members of the of the committee that it's going through or or anything like that. So and, and at this point, it's just going to the finance committee, which is interesting versus yeah. the uh, local government. It is, yeah. So is the is the bill structured in a way to where it only applies to cities that sound like Spokane, or is it <laughs> statewide? I, I have I, not I, read I it. Yet. I haven't read it yet. Okay. It's it, it's right. It's it actually it's a pretty short bill, three three pages. No. It would be a county with a population of five hundred thousand or more. Okay. So it'll affect Clark and Snohomish as well. Okay. Well, uh, Josh, you want to make a motion to authorize the letter? Letter. Yeah. So so are we gonna? So what, what's what's the d desire? Do we want to authorize a letter that we that only we sign, or do we want to authorize um, the use of our stamps on a larger level or on a larger letter with more folks if Burgess feels that's appropriate? What what's what's the will of the board? Yeah, I, I would say we want to have both options available based on okay. the determination by Mike Burgess. Okay. Yeah, I'd structure right. it uh, for the global approach. Sounds good. Uh, Mr. Chair, move to approve and authorize um, either the drafting or signing, uh, drafting and signing of a letter um, at other than open public meeting expressing the Board of County Commissioners opposition to House Bill 1155 or um, authorizing the use of the commissioner's signatures to sign on any other letters expressing opposition to House Bill 1155, um, whichever is deemed more appropriate by Spokane County's lobbyist, Mike Burgess. I will second that. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. All right, what's that? The letter, doing the letter. Uh, so, Who's going to draft the letter? In fact, if we are going to do a letter, I I would ask if if we can just get a copy of that letter with the law enforcement signatures. And I I assume Jared could probably just tweak the introduction to it, and maybe even the closing, and maybe take the bulk of what the meat of that letter is, um, and make it our own. Okay. I, I mean, if, okay if, if if we can get a copy of it. Are you okay yeah. with that, Yes, no, I'm okay with that. They're they're working on the letter. I mean, literally, this all just came up like at 9:45. We were on the phone with Burgess, so so they're working on it. Um, so yeah, so I would just take whatever letter they've got, and then again, either we sign on to that or we we draft our own individual. And if so if, if, if we if we need to draft our own that that's that's different, I would say. Um, have Jared and Jerry, I mean, J Jerry knows more about this than any of us um, yeah. as, as a board member, just, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be more than three paragraphs just stating right. why we're opposed to it and then we sign it. So something mm -hmm. really, really brief and short. And so if, if we draft it, I would, I would recommend or suggest that Jared just connect with Jerry and get a couple of paragraphs on a, on a page and call it good. No problem. Who's who is working on the other letter right now? Lori Markham. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but we 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 don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we're we're firing off that letter the day of the hearing or something. We you know we we want to we want to get that out as as quick as possible if if we have to draft our own. We want to we want to get that done as quick as possible. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Gimmel? I think Mr. Vote on that? I don't have anything. I think Mr. Macho has an executive session. Uh, Chairman French, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I have one executive session. It deals with pending potential litigation. My, uh, my sense is it would take probably five to seven minutes. I do not expect any action by the Board of County Commissioners on this item. Okay, so why don't we allow, allocate 10 minutes to an executive session uh, that will take us until 11.06. And uh, in the executive session will be all three commissioners, senior management team, 
and uh, to include Mr. Maceo. Thank you, Chairman French. When we reach the end of the executive session, we will be adjourned for this morning and we'll reconvene at two o'clock this afternoon.